Hello, everyone. Happy Friday, and welcome to today's webinar. My name is Adam, and I will be your moderator. I'd like to welcome Dr. Stephen Vorholt as our speaker as he discusses unexpected applications of 3D printing, including surgical adjuncts, restorative tools, and much more. Any questions that you think of during the webinar, please drop them into the Q&A section, and we'll answer them live at the end as we have time. And Henry Schein is not offering CE credit for viewing or attending this presentation live or on demand. With that, I will throw it over to Dr. Vorholt. All right, thank you, thank you. Um, so welcome, uh, I'm very excited to talk about uh, some unexpected applications of 3D printing. Uh, I think that this is probably one of the most evolving technologies in dentistry right now as far as what it can accomplish and, and especially is how quickly that's happened. I mean, the last three to five years, this has really exploded on the scene. Um, so real quickly, just uh, a quick blur about who I am. Um, I'm Stephen Vorholt. I graduated from The Ohio State University in 2013, and I had private practice there in Columbus uh, for about six years. I recently joined Implant Pathways, so recently, almost two years ago, um, and now I work there full time. So I moved from Columbus, Ohio to Scottsdale, Arizona, um, and I'm the surgical director down here at Implant Pathway. So most of my job includes um, it's all dental implant. Uh, follow-ups, surgeries, and screenings. So I get to kind of see what we call the wake that comes behind the live patient courses we do. So what's been really exciting is I was a big 3D printer um, dentist in Ohio in my private practice, and I was able to bring a lot of that down here with me to Implant Pathway. So we get to utilize a lot of the 3D printing stuff for some really, really cool adjunctive uses, um, especially during surgeries for the most part. So uh, I do co-host the Implant Pathway podcast if you want to kind of get a behind the scenes what we do here um, with Dr. Epperson. Um, and I'm currently this summer sitting for my uh, written and oral boards for um, some dental um, credentialing, which is really exciting. Uh, quick shout out to Jacob Howe, who is my local rep in Columbus, Ohio. Uh, he's been with me since I placed my first implant in 2015. It was actually a Henry Schein course I took over the weekend. Um, and just the ball started rolling there. So uh, I haven't been in Ohio for two years. He still reaches out to me. He actually reached out to me this week when he saw that I was doing a webinar and got it through the email and was like, man, this is awesome. Uh, good for you. Can't wait to look, uh, look at it when it's on replay. So a uh, big shout out to Jacob. He's just been an awesome, constant uh, cheering squad, even, even though I'm across the country now. So um, thanks to him. So the outline today, what we're going to be talking about, um, do a quick overview on 3D printing. If um, I know there's a lot of awesome webinars on Henry Schein's uh, replay on 3D printing. Um, we'll do a quick, quick overview. I'll try to go through it really fast, just if, if you're not super familiar with it. Um, some current and common uses, things that I've done in private practice, things that I know a lot of people are doing right now, and the return on investment you can get. So if you're not currently doing 3D printing, um, I think it's the biggest return on investment as far as, you know, as far as the lowest cost entry level for a dental piece of equipment. I mean, we're talking about x-ray sensors that are more expensive than it is to get the whole bundle to set up to start doing 3D printing um, in your office. So then at the uh, this back half of the webinar, we're gonna talk about some more interesting, some more adjunctive uses for 3D printing, some things that are pushing the envelope a little bit, some pretty creative uses that I think will become more mainstream as we um, as this continues to evolve. And then we'll have time for some Q&A. And I do have the Q&A open. So if you have questions throughout the webinar, um, if I see it pop up, um, I'll answer it if, uh, if I know the answer. So let's talk about what 3D printers are available right now. Um, the two on the left are probably the most applicable to a general dentistry office, the Sprint Ray Pro and the Form Labs 3. Um, the two in the middle, the Envision Tech 1 and the Sega Max are much more accurate um, but they're much more expensive. And you'll see those a lot more in, in practices that are doing a lot of full arch uh, rehabs or full arch printed temps. Um, you can certainly do those with the Sprint Ray Pro and the Form Labs 3, but there's a little bit more accuracy when it comes to those middle ones, but they're in the 10 to $20,000 range. And a lot of labs will also use the, those printers. And then on the far right, you have um, the Tesla of 3D printers, the Carbon, which is um, actually only available for lease and you don't even own it. I think it's about 40 or $50,000 a year just to host that thing in your office. So mostly um, on a high-end lab um, process for the carbon. Uh, so the two main ones um, that we talk about in general dentistry practice uh, are the Sprint Ray and the Form Labs. There's a little bit difference in how they print. So they're kind of, there's two main ways to do 3D printing. 
Um, what I like about the Sprint Ray Pro, um, I've always been a Sprint Ray guy. I had the Moon Ray when it first came out. DLP printing is, in a sense, printing layer by layer. So it's almost like a flash and it prints the whole layer at once. Whereas the SLA printing is more like a laser pointer and it hits every pixel that you're printing. So what that means in layman's terms is the printing on the Sprint Ray is only limited by how tall your print is, which means you could put you know, 15 models that are all the same height, it's gonna print the same speed as one model. Whereas when you work with an SLA printer, that one model will print a lot faster and the more volume you add, um, will slow it down. So when we're talking about general dentistry practices and what I think the biggest return on investment is for 3D printing, um, I think the DLP style fits a little bit better. The build platform is also a little bit bigger. That's just the area that you can print on. So you can print more or larger things. Um, the one thing that's really nice about the Sprint Ray is they have a lot of third-party resins. There is typically a small fee to add that to your software repertoire. It's not very expensive, um, but that allows you to use a huge mass of third-party resins for whether it's dentures or crown and bridge, um, wax ups, um, all sorts. Whereas some of the other companies, they're, you're a little bit more locked into kind of what they white label or what they offer. So well, I think it's one of the best things you can do in your general dentistry practice. And honestly, a lot of our staff nowadays are, are very into 3D printing. If you have a younger staff, they might even have a toy 3D printer or be familiar with it. Um, when I was in private practice, most of my staff were between the ages of 19 and 25, and they kind of took this and ran with it. So once I trained them on how the machine worked and how to set up prints, um, it was pretty much hands off for me. Um, I would tell them what we wanted to print for whatever application we were using, and they would load it into the software, print it, um, clean it, wash it, you know, and all that kind of stuff. So nowadays for less than 10,000, which is less than one of those, you know, Schick 33 sensors, you can, you can get a printer, um, build blades, models, model resin, the, the cleaner and the cure box. So you can kind of have a whole suite um, set up and they look really cool. So if, if you're one of those, um, doctors who's really high on technology, I think the return on investment that you can't necessarily quantify is that that patient perception of just, of just having the higher tech stuff, you're pushing the envelope in your practice. So whether it kind of smells because of the resins, I wouldn't necessarily put it in your hallway, um, but it might be something that you could, you could put on your social media or you could uh, show on a tour or however you decide to showcase it in your office. So let's talk about quickly about the return on investment um, for 3D printing. I think that a lot of people immediately think of 3D printing as like 3D printing surgical guides, which that was my first thought too. And the reason I wanted a 3D printer was to bring surgical guides in house. However, there are a multitude of things we can do that actually are more of a return on investment than surgical guides. So one of them is, is simply study models, um, digital wax ups, rather than paying a local lab or a national lab, almost $30 a tooth to design and send you a wax up with a with a putty stent or something like that, you could outsource it somewhere digital, um, whether it's international or in the country or local even, and then 3D print the wax up and make your own putty stent, you know, with a, with a putty matrix. Um, I think that is probably really, really cool for if you're trying to sell bigger cases, veneer cases, full mouth rehab cases, to be able to do that that in the patient's mouth and bring it to them. So um, you can also design it for yourself for free if you're a real tinker, if you're like me and you wanna learn Mesh Mixer or Blue Sky Bio and get really, really into the nerdy stuff. Um, here's a case, this is a patient of mine, uh, Brandon, who came in and just did a normal hygiene visit. And I said, Brandon, you ever thought about, you know, filling in these gaps and, um, you know, based on the arch width and spacing, the orthodontics didn't make sense to to constrict both arches. So so we could, we could look at some sort of uh, wax up and see if it would be appropriate or if the teeth look too wide. Like, why not? Let's just look at it and see what it would look like. So I sent that off. Um, I may have actually done this myself in Mesh Mixer, uh, but you can see the models that are closest to us in the Sprint Ray uh, printing software here have wax up on the front six teeth. Uh, so I printed both. I printed the original and the uh, wax up teeth models. And then what I did simply was I made a suck down. I could have also made a putty stent that would have worked just just fine. I did a suck down on our mini star machine. Um, and so I had a little, you know, copy template. Uh, we took that to Brandon's mouth. And this is obviously before I cleaned it up. I, for some reason, I didn't take a photo after we cleaned up all the margins, but we were able to see that, hey, look, this will work. Like this will not make your teeth look too wide if we're able to just kind of borrow spacing in the gaps uh, in the appropriate spaces. So this was something that Brandon had never 
considered. I mean, he was a young guy working in IT. I think he was probably 24 at the time. And these were just his teeth. Um, and then once we showed him this, it was kind of like, wow, the possibilities. And that's, that's all it takes for some patients too. And so if you, you can bring that cost down from having to charge a patient $500 to get a wax up, I mean, that's already a barrier to them until they see it. And whereas it might cost you in resin and you know, the design fee, it could be less than hundred dollars. So maybe that's something even you as an office decide to eat the cost on because you know, your case acceptance on something like this would go, would, uh, would become so much higher. So the return on investment there is maybe even immeasurable, but um, if you were charging patients for it, I mean, you can save hundreds on each one of these. So I think that's a really, really cool way to do it. Um, clearly this is what I was most interested in was surgical guides. I think $3 in resin and then however you decide to design it, whether it's yourself or with a lab, I mean, we're still under $75 easily versus some of the uh, lab bills. And I was a Serona doctor. So if I send it off to Germany, I mean, it was $300, $400 pretty quickly. Um, what you don't really consider also is the time. I mean, you could do this in a day. I had patients who would come in and broke number 10. And I would say, you know, come back this afternoon. And by then I would have made a, a surgical guide for them. So the turnaround is much, much faster. So, um, you know, if it's something where it's cheaper and faster and more efficient, and better for the patient. It's like a win, 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 win. So um, the return on investment there, I mean, nowadays you can get a lab to make your surgical guide probably for a hundred bucks, 150 bucks. So it might take a little while to recoup those costs if you're if you're saving $50 a time, but bringing this in office can certainly recoup your cost on the restorative phase of implant surgery, where now it's no longer, you know, a difficult rest restoration to do because you had to do a custom above or because the angle was a little bit funky or whatever. So, you know, it's, it's money saved down the line as well. Um, and peace of mind for when you're doing the surgery. So um, this is a quick video that I've sped up 10 times of just how I do my guides now. And it's it's pretty simple. I mean, I, I drop the implant into my Acteon software and their guided software using my SCL to uh, merge. And then I constantly reference the patient photos. So we take photos on all of our patients um, at their initial whack, at their initial consult. And, you know, within 10 minutes, I'm able to double check everything and kind of get the angle perfect for whether I want to do screw retained or angled screw channel, or if I'm going to go for a custom abutment and cement retained crown, um, you know, picking the different sleeves and then designing. It's almost like designing a night guard. You just tell the software where you want the guide to lay. So we're making an outline there and then make some windows in it. And then you just export it and you can even export the plan um, that comes with it. That'll tell you exactly you know, what drills to use and, and make your own little notes. So you're, uh, so you're fully in, but that takes 10 minutes to print probably about half an hour and to clean it up another half an hour. So within two hours easily, you could, if you needed to, to rush it, have something ready to go for the patient's mouth. So this is, uh, I had some surgical guides I had printed over the last month and I don't normally have this many to print at once, but I was just showing how many uh, we could fit on the screen at once. Um, and this is the Pro 95 build plate. So it's that bigger seven by four inch build plate. And you can see at the bottom, the bottom left right next to my email is how long this is going to take to print. So like I said, sprint ray is only determined by the height of your tallest print because it prints layer by layer at a set speed. So for however many surgical guides this is, 12 surgical guides or whatever, you know, an hour and five minutes, and we're going to use 52 milliliters of resin and the resin is about uh, $300 for a liter. So do the math real quick. And, you know, we're talking $60 or something like that for, um, for 12 guides. So five bucks a guide, something like that. So the return is certainly there, but I think bringing it into your office, being a high tech office in your town uh, has its own, maybe not so quantifiable return as well, which is really cool. This is becoming more and more popular uh, digital dentures. Um, now you're really bringing down the cost. And if you're having this design either yourself or um, with an online collaborator, I mean, we're talking hundred bucks total for dentures. Now, do they look that great? Look at the one on the left that Dr. Matt Stanridge does. I mean, you're starting to be able to really do some stuff if you're able to use, um, you know, pink composites, annex gum, um, um, different bond protocols to give it that shine. Um, but man, for the cost, if, if you put this in the patient's mouth as an immediate denture and the midline's off, you go back, you tweak it and you print it again. You can have it like that day or that the next day. Um, you know, you could also use them as a, the, the most appropriate custom tray ever for a denture impression and also have the, the teeth set up. So 
this um, as an economical approach, as an immediate denture approach is becoming more and more popular. And if you're interested in this, Dr. Matt Stanridge does um, an awesome job explaining how this works. So grab him on, um, on Instagram. He teaches with 3D dentists. He actually teaches a lot of digital ortho as well. But um, I think this is going to become a, a bigger and bigger thing. And most labs that I know of are actually 3D printing their dentures now. So um, it's, a, it's definitely, it makes the most sense. It's the only thing in dentistry that's certainly acrylic and resin. So um, of all things to be on a 3D printer, a digital denture m makes the most sense. Uh, night guards are also another thing. So this is a next dent resin and it's one of those third party resins that you can use on a sprint ray printer. So it's not a sprint ray resin, but you can open your catalog to these. Um, very stiff. It certainly doesn't look stiff. It looks nice and shiny, but it's, it's got a pretty stiff base. And um, Baron Gretter, who's a great friend of mine, the mentor of mine, when I got into 3D printing, he makes these little ramps. You can see that these are um, kind of printed on, so you don't have to have all those supports and you don't have to print off all and don't have to buzz off all the supports. But um, quick, quick night guards for $10 each uh, that you can print in a day. Patient loses it. All right, we'll reprint it. Like, you know, this is the kind of stuff 3D printing it allows you to do, have the flexibility for the speed um, for your patients. You know, so if someone were to lose this and say, hey, my, we went on vacation and my son left it on vacation. Okay, I'll print it and mail it to you. Like, you know, this is the kind of stuff you can start to offer as a value add in your practice, uh, which is really, really cool. This is where I think the most return comes from. And so when I started doing 3D printing, uh, we'll talk a little bit more in depth about how I got started, but orthodontics in-house, if you're already doing something like Invisalign, um, or Sure Smile, and some of these companies will actually just sent you the digital file for a, a, a lower case fee. Um, bringing that in-house and 3D printing it can save you over $1,000 a case. So in this case, like $500 a case was all in. That included the design fee, the printable resin, the staff time, all the trays, like everything was, was uh, found out and $500 a case versus almost $2,000 for Invisalign for them to send you the trays and you still do you know, all the work after that. So I think that for the return on investment, orthodontic in-office printing for aligners is probably the best return. Now, obviously you need to get CE to know how to do aligners and the appropriate um, cases to attempt with it and whatnot. But um, if you can, if you do have that training and you're comfortable with it, bringing that in-house can be a huge um, return on your investment. So this was a company I use called Exceed Ortho and they would send you what's essentially a, a clinical check and they would show you where the buttons are, where the attachments are, where they want to move the teeth. Um, and you could run the simulation. And so I might reach out and say, hey, let's let's lengthen this to 30 trays. Let's try this button. Um, you know, if you, whatever training you're familiar with, with aligner therapy, um, you know, what's really impressive was the as I was using them over three years, I could tell that their software was was actually improving. So I'm sure it's even more impressive now because this case is about two years old now. But you can see the superposition of the teeth that were there, how the teeth are moving, you know, you know, if this is appropriate. And then, you know, you might call them back and say, hey, there's actually, a, a, I have an Emacs crown on 14. Can we put the attachment on 13 instead? I don't want to have to bond an Emacs crown or something like that. Um, so that was, you know, they'll show you where the interproximal reduction is. Um, and this case was maybe my eighth case on aligners. And I think a lot of you who are doing aligners now probably thought, well, that's kind of insane because this is an unbelievable amount of uncoupling um, and uh, overlap of these teeth, but it actually turned out really, really well. So here it was, and it was almost a year. I mean, it's 26 trays. This is with no refinements. Um, what's nice about a lot of those companies, the, the one refinement is included in the, in the cost. So all you would do is take new scans, um, send them back. They would redesign whatever your next set of trays are. So uh, we were able to, to put uh, her teeth in an amazing alignment in about one year. And obviously this patient was extremely compliant. Um, that's probably the number one rule for aligner ortho is you have to have compliant patients to pull this off. But um, I think the return on investment there is, is the greatest. And then just a case in point, uh, the Moonray S was the one that I had, the printer I had first, that's the build plate you're seeing on the right. So a little bit smaller, but we were still able to fit nine of these um, models on at a time. So. What I, what now, when you compare it to the Pro 95, which is what um, it's kind of on the market right now, I mean, I think I squeezed 14 or 15 models, maybe even 
17, if I'm counting correctly, on the Pro 95. And so what I thought was really neat about Sprint Ray and that that the speed of the vertical build, you know, the height being the only limiter was that I could print this before leaving the office or the staff could print it. And when we came back in the morning, this print would be ready to go. They take off that build plate. We would have several build plates because you don't want to be limited by you're still washing or, or cleaning uh, a set of prints. So slide the next build plate in and start a print in the morning. At lunchtime, that's already been done for a couple hours. You can start another print. So we could print 17 models three times a day. So if you're a high volume practice, one of these printers could print, I mean, was that 51 models a day for ortho line? That's a lot of, a lot of printing um, capacity. And then if you have different build plates, and resin tanks for surgical guides, you know, maybe at lunch you're printing surgical guides and overnight you're doing aligners, ortho. Um, so I, th I think that for the best bang for your buck, this is what you what you can bring into, into house if you're already doing it especially. So here's actually how I did it. I, I sent a email out to my entire uh, patient list. I think I had about 1800 patients at the time. And to get started in 3D printing, I needed a more powerful laptop. I needed uh, a desktop scanner because I had a Sarek Blue Scan Blue Cam, which was not accurate enough for full art scanning. So I bought a five thousand dollar desktop scanner. Had to take some CE, and I needed one of those positive pressure machines, the Mini Star or the Drew Format. Needed one of those. So rather than go out and get a loan for all of this, I sent this email, and it just said, "Hey, Dr. Warholtz, off to Utah." And it's a little clickbaity, but uh, I basically wanted people to think I was leaving forever. Ironically enough, two years later, I did, but. Uh, to Arizona. So in Utah was a course by Baron Grutter to teach uh, aligner ortho. And so what I did is I sent this email. I said, hey, I want to reach out to you to sign an announcement. We're going to start doing early bird patients for clear ortho aligners. And the price we were going to charge was about 5000 So we offered 50% off for the first 10 patients to, to get on the list who were interested in this. And basically, I explained in the email, I can't really be taking this course. Um, I need some people who I want to build a book of for like pre-op and post-op. So you'll be kind of a uh, uh, models. And for that benefit, we'll give you half off. And so I just had a simple mail list, kind of a link that they could get in the top 10. And we got about 18 people to sign up in the first four days, uh, brought them all in. Um, we ended up signing up 12. So, and I know I said top 10, but you know, sue me. So we actually let everybody in that wanted to be in. So 12 people, the only rule was they had to pay all 2,500 up front. So we ended up with $30,000 in cash and spent about 20 of that buying the printer, the CE, the laptop, the desktop scanner, and had about 10,000 left over for, you know, just profit because that's what you need to, to buy all the parts and pieces and, and run a practice. So what was really cool is I didn't have to go get a loan. I actually kind of in a sense crowdsourced um, my first 3D printer and got started by um, offering a liner ortho and those patients loved it. The fact that they didn't have to go to the orthodontist to a different practice and, you know, orthodontists at the time were charging 6,500 to 7,000 for Invisalign. Um, so this was a steal. And this, this is in your practice right now. There's people who want this, who have relapsed ortho, who have lower anterior crowding um, that you can certainly help. Okay. So now we've, uh, we've, we've found out how to pay for the printer. So those are, those are kind of the things that I think are the most common. That's what people are doing in day-to-day -day practice, general dentistry, ortho, surgical guides, digital wax ups, dentures. Cool. So what can we do that's a little bit on the cusp or a little bit different to in enhance that return on investment? Maybe now we're going to get a return on our own sanity or our own time or our own efficiency um, or just our comfort in doing different things. So one of the things that um, I really enjoy is when we do surgery, implant surgery, most of the stock abutments are just cylinders. And there's very few teeth that have cylinder emergence profiles. It might be like first premolars and that's it on the lower. So if you have this case here where we've done number 30, everything looks great and you take that off, that's gonna be, I call it a tomato on a popsicle stick. That crown is going to come out of the gums like just like the impression is, and it's gonna to have to quickly, quickly uh, veer out mesial and distal to get contact. So you end up with this kind of tomato on a popsicle stick. It just looks ridiculous. So how can we fix that? Well, there's a lot of ways to do custom healers, which is um, the main way to fix that, whether you do a temporary crown or a custom healer. So you can make them chair side. 
it's um it takes some extra time it's not the easiest thing you're working in like a bloody field the patient's there they're numb um you can use these peak cylinders you can use a titanium temp cylinder you can do this at the time of implant placement or at uncovery and you know it's it works great um but it's you have to have, you have to have the time i mean this is a little time consuming and you also have to be able to work with your hands and, and get this right and set this in so in this case it's a, just a peak cylinder um that put in the mouth marked where the buckle was put some flowable down and then outside the mouth kind of created the contour you wanted so you know this takes 10 20 minutes maybe a little bit longer depending on the complexity of the case the other option is to go ahead and just buy them beforehand so contour tissue healers they um you can buy them they're 60 dollars each so they're almost three times the cost of the normal healing abutment um they're great and but man they're expensive so you start getting into this kind of cost and pretty quickly your implant fee has to start going up or you're going back to just using standard healing abutments. Nowadays, there's also companies out there like uh, Cervico where they make pre-made molds. Um, I think it's a better option than hand doing it or buying the contour healers because you have a lot more flexibility. You, and basically on the right side picture, you can see they've inserted like a titanium base or titanium coping and then they just use flowable. So they pick whatever mold of the tooth they're using. So in that mold, it probably has pretty much, you know, incisors, canines, premolars, and molars for top and bottom. Uh, but they're expensive. I mean, the, the cost of this is $2,000 for the premium kit. If you just want the mold, you're talking $1,500. So to get that return on the versus buying the custom healers and 40, you know, you're saving 40 bucks a time, uh, you better be doing a lot of implants to make this work. But it's a great system. I mean, it, it works really, really well. But that's not what we're here to talk about. We're here to talk about 3D printers. And 3D printers can allow you to do this for pennies on the dollar. So you still have to have a tie base or titanium cylinder or some sort of thing that connects to the implant. But here you have um, something that uh, Dr. Patrick Moore and Baron Grutter developed, a piece of software, and it's free. They just give it away. Um, it's called the Anatomic Profile Generator. And you can see on that bottom photo, you can just 3D print in whatever resin you want, probably some sort of crown and bridge resin. Um, and then he's inserting the tie base into the back and just looting it, picking it up. Then you just trim it to the appropriate height and you're done. So you can have these pre-printed, ready to go, put them in a little tackle box and whatever tooth or size or contour is appropriate, you loot the tie base outside the mouth and you're good to go. Um, so you know, now we're talking, it's free software. So now we're talking less than a dollar easily per um, custom healer. And then it's just whatever the cost your titanium cylinder is, whether it's, you know, 10, $15 or something like that. So, um, and it gives you the flexibility that the pre-made molds do without the cost of the contoured healers. This is a really cool um, idea that I've seen a couple people utilize. Uh, Dr. Sonata, who I think is uh, just fascinating. If you're not following him on Instagram, if you're into implant surgery or prosthetics, he's unbelievable. Um, but they had made a stent for the temporary crown. So we're going one step further from custom healer to actually a custom temporary crown. So in this case, uh, the lab in, um, in his clinic designed this stent. So essentially a surgical guide. So he's already placed this implant gui guided. So this goes over the same, the holes in the same position as the implant. It's pre-designed and printed, and it just hovers the resin tooth over your titanium cylinder. So now that snaps onto the teeth, you loot the cylinder, you just cut the little sacrificial um, you know, co copings that are holding it on together um, and clean it up and do the uh, underside contour and you're done. So temporary crowns, that's that's a pretty clever way to do it. He even goes so far as to do some full arch temps. So here they have an example of a, a maxillary stent. So using the hard palate as an indexing stop. Um, so you know you're in the, you've designed it with a hard vertical stop for the VDO. You can pick up, it looks like six implants and he's got ponics and shells for his crowns and stuff like that. So um, this is pretty amazing. And I bet that cost in resin probably about $10, if not less. Um, and who knows what a lab would charge you for something like that. So the fact that you can bring that in house um, and it's an unbelievable uh, advantage for the surgeon and the patient to have these uh, pre-contoured and, and healing immediately like that. So. Um, we're talking about custom healers. Now we're talking about custom temporary crowns. Talk, continuing on the surgery, um, Midwest Dental Arts is uh, owned by Justin McElroy down in Florida. And he's, it's a lab. Uh, they do some pretty high-end aesthetic stuff. And they also do um, some, they train with some awesome surgeons as well. 
and they've done some um, of these gingivectomy guides. And what's really, really neat about these is you need an aesthetic wax up. So you're working with your lab anyway, typically, because you say, like, how much do we want to show? And for a healthy periodontal tissue, we know you have to have three millimeters from the bone to the gum margin, you know, biologic width and all that. So what they've done in these guides is they've actually designed that arch that goes that's above the gum to be three millimeters thick. So in a sense, you start by doing the soft tissue contour inside the guided windows, and that's your ideal wax up. Now the teeth look right, flap, and now that that, that is a three millimeter wide band apical to the tooth, that's where your bone reduction needs to be. So it's one guide for both techniques. If you need to do the surgical part, the bony reduction, you've already got a guide stent ready to go for it. So I think this is um, a really cool case. You can see the before and then the one side. So they just used a laser um, and we're going up. So now we have this, this beautiful contour of the clinical crowns finally being shown. And then if we look at the next set of pictures, a different case, this one required a bony reduction the same stent is used once the flap is raised and we can now go in and, and, and know exactly where the contour of the bone needs to be. So using some sort of sterile graphite pencil perhaps to just mark that and then take the guide out and kind of clean up that bone. Um, so it's just some stent. So you could even do this for your own surgeon. So if you're working collaboratively with a periodontist or a surgeon who does these kind of cases with you, now you've got the ability to send the patient with this guide and say, hey, heads up, I'm sending you a guide of where I want the aesthetic crown margins to be. Um, that can give you kind of control over a case that maybe isn't even technically in your chair, um, which I think is really, really cool. And that's something that nowadays, if you have the 3D printer or you work with a, a lab that does and you're collaborating with a lot of specialists in your area, this is a way for you guys to have better communication and, um, and better results. So the, the patient is coming back to you and you're, you and the patient think, ah, oh, we were kind of thinking it'd be this or that. So um, I think that's really, really neat. Custom trays, uh, something that also makes a lot of sense if we're, right now we're doing custom trays in triad still, probably a lot of us, um, or some sort of base plate. Whereas now there's free software. So imagine a better use for a resin printer um, than one that's utilizing uh, custom trays. So all you need to do is you take your allergen impression, take your digital scan, if you're a digital scanning doctor, um, import it into the Zircazon modifier. This is also a, uh, I believe it's a free software. And all you're gonna do is basically mark the edges of your base plate. And what it's gonna do is it's going to print out or design a digital file that looks like a custom tray. And then you can put the holes in it. Um, you can print this out, put the little handle on the front as well. And when you've got the handle, obviously, you know, adhesive on the inside polyvinyl, um, if that's what you're using, and you've got a custom tray that was completely digital. And so, you know, what I'd like to do in our practice, because we do a lot of overdentures and we do a lot of custom tray impressions, when I do the uncovery surgery for a six implant overdenture, I'm starting with an alginate just to make a custom tray. So patient gets numb, alginate for a custom tray, do the surgery, put them in healing abutments, and then, the pa and then we adjust the patient's current denture. The patient will come back usually about a week or two later uh, after the gums have healed and we have a custom tray. And we have a lab on site, but they are making a lot of dentures. So to have them also make 10 custom trays a week, it's not a huge workload, but imagine if we, we had a digital designer do this and we 3D printed them. And now it's no time except hitting print and cleaning them up. Um, it can make a big difference. And they're nice and accurate and you can put tissue stops on it you can do whatever you want with these things so i think custom trays are another you know not a huge return on investment but if we're going to be making things more efficient um, for yourself and for the lab um, really nice you could even turn this around in a, easily in a day if you saw the patient that morning you want to make a custom custom tray for that afternoon no problem this is one thing that i think is is one of the most interesting and one of the things that leads to um kind of the biggest jump in what you can do surgically is segmenting jaw bones from your CBCT data. So your CBCT is a hard tissue x-ray. You can, as you go through slice by slice and a lot of softwares, you can do the segmentation yourself. It's very time consuming and it's um, kind of easy to get it wrong. So you can also send this off to a lab, a lab that I prefer is uh, image 3D conversion, um, 50 to hundred dollars per jawbone, depending on how much you want them to do. Um, we'll utilize it for 
um, what you see in the photo where they can extract the teeth for you. So they can actually send you the jawbone as if there's no teeth in it. So that might be super helpful for pre-planning for prosthetically driven surgery or knowing like where I'm going to put implants or how, what angles I can do because I can now see the nerve and stuff like that. And their turnaround is extremely quick. So we're talking 24 hour turnaround for, and I sent them 50 models and I got all 50 back in 24 hours. So, um, and they're extremely accurate. When you load them into your software, it's, it's very, very impressive by how detailed they're able to get. So what can we do with them? Well, some bone borne surgical guides. I mean, I think this is, um, a lot of people are doing this already with labs for like Chrome or NDX. Um, and these, these bigger, bigger cases where you have pin retained guides, you could do that all yourself. If you want to take the CE to learn how to do that, have a lab like, or uh, image 3D conversion, send you back the STLs for the upper and lower jaws. And now we can plan where our bone reduction needs to be and make a pin retained guide for that. So um, going a step further on top of that, you can also do the surgical guide portion of that, which is really, really neat. So now we're utilizing the same pin holes, the same retention pins um, for the guided placement and putting our implants exactly where we want them to be for our final prosthetic. So case that we did here in the clinic, um, young lady had a uh, terminal dentition and we were able to utilize these pen guides so that we made sure everything was set up. So pre-planned prosthetic, uh, we knew exactly how much reduction we needed. We knew where the bone was going to be the best. So you can see obviously the pre-op on the upper left, the upper right was after the extraction and the placement of the bone reduction guide. And then once the bone's reduced to the appropriate level, which is just the level of that guide, you snap in the um, actual implant surgical guide. So now we're placing the implants through the guide sleeves. And then our final, um, you can see on the lower right. And you know the difference is just unbelievable. So this is one day apart. And she looks like an entirely different person. Um, we're still working, her case is still working through like the fixed, um, getting her into a fixed zirconia, but it's been a life changer for her. Um, she reached, she's actually from out of state. She comes in from Oklahoma um, and flies down to Phoenix as, as we need her for appointments, but she's over the moon about it. And we couldn't be happier. So being able to bring that in house in a guy that, you know, a patient like her that we're doing pro bono, um, you know, we can't really afford a $6,000 lab bill per arch um, for doing something with like a Chrome or a row or an NDX. Um, but be able to bring that in house now, as long as you know the how to work the software and have the time to do it, you know, the actual hard cost, the resin for that is $50. I mean, that's even on the high, high end because we printed a lot of different models, but um, you know, you're, you're changing lives and you can even maybe bring your own costs down so you can change more people's lives, which I think is, uh, is always the, the goal. If we're looking at um, study models just for larger surgeries, so I think anatomy review is really important. Um, if I was a starting implant surgeon doing some full arch stuff, some overdentures, to pay $50 to have the patient's jawbones um, digitally segmented so I could 3D print them and hold them in my hand, either while I'm doing the surgery or before to plan on the surgery. Um, in this example, I mean, we could, we could use this model to maybe draw a line of where we want our bone reduction to be, maybe to visualize the mental foramen more easily. Um, you know, these are so accurate that even those little nuances, that little dip there in the 27 area, that would be visualized in the surgery. So you'd know exactly where you are on the model, because it's not always easy when you're in, a, in the mouth and it's full of blood or um, you know, the surgical field's a little bit less uh, visualized. Um, you can have this model out there and know, okay, so I'm, you know, 15 millimeters from the mental once I get to this part and that kind of stuff. So I think that, especially for someone who's just getting into surgery or is getting into bigger surgeries, having an adjunctive tool like that to just lay on the patient bib or lay on the tray behind you um, it can, is super helpful. Um, in the case on the right, that's a symphysis uh, bone graft harvesting. Um, so knowing where that's going to be measuring, um, you know, from the mental frame and apices of the teeth, making sure you're not going through the lingual plate, knowing the thickness, um, nothing but helpful to have this kind of model. And for the cost, $50 to have it segmented and a couple dollars in resin, um, it makes a lot of sense. We use it here at Implant Pathway during our lateral sinus course. So I sent, these are the 50 models I sent to MS3D conversion. They got back within a day of the patient's maxilla. And this one's a little bit more expensive to segment because I asked them to leave it hollow. So I wanted to see the internal um, contours of the maxillary sinus and the nasal 
uh, floor. So you can see on that model, um, the pterygoid plates, the lateral and the medial pterygoid plate, obviously the maxillary sinus, the zygomatic buttress, and um, the whole maxillary arch. And so you see on the right is what we would typically do is while we're while we're working on working up the cases and the patient's getting numb, you know, we're looking at the model and saying, okay, here's where I think we want our window to be because we can look, you know, inside the sinus and outside the sinus. We actually do the surgery on these models and kind of bring that into the mouth by measuring from the zygomatic buttress or bony landmarks or something like that, the floor of the nose and what have you. When we're talking about lateral windows, you know, there's a very set amount of rules for where and why this window goes where it goes. So the way I used to do it when I was first doing lateral windows was I would measure from bony landmarks like you see on that left photo. So I say, okay, from the uh, CEJ or the bony crest of that premolar, I go up 11.5 and I make a, a mark with my surgical pencil. And if I go back to the crest anterior to the molar at 7.7, .7, I got two lines, I connect the two lines now, and I'm basically going back and forth from the cone beam software into the mouth. And I'm trying to make sure that my window is going to be appropriate. So we want our window typically to be one to three millimeters above the sinus floor. We want the window to be about one to two millimeters posterior to the anterior wall. Um, these all help us to get better uh, sinus membrane elevation without potentially uh, fracturing if we're gonna put implants in at the same time. And we wanna make sure we get all the way to the anterior wall as well. So on the right is that same patient, we had drawn it with uh, the pencil and um, that was how we would utilize those models as well. So, you know, a lot of times we were going from the cone beam um, back to the patient's mouth over and over again. Here we have uh, the next iteration of that, I suppose, which is, okay, now we know where we want our window to be. Why don't we make something that we can take into the patient's mouth so we're not sitting there and measuring with our perio probe um, up from the CEJ of, you know, four. So in this case, um, we have um, just a surgical guide that we made on the bony model. So image 3D conversion converts the maxilla. We make a guide just like we would on a normal STL with teeth, but we're making a window right where it needs to be. So um, what's really neat is when you take this into the patient's mouth, you've got, here's the, the uh, bony segmentation and the guide resting on the teeth. It'll, once you have a flap that big, you can rest this right on the lateral wall of the sinus, and you're not going to necessarily use this guide to prep your window, but certainly taking a pencil and outlining that is a lot faster and more accurate than going back and forth to bony landmarks on a radiograph. Um, so that certainly allows you to um, maybe have your surgery be a little bit faster, certainly more accurate. You don't have to continue to wonder if you're cutting your window into the alveolus instead of the sinus, and you know you're your angle is right from the very, very beginning. So like in this case, we you can see the guide outline in the yellow. The guide is two millimeters above the floor of the sinus and then about three and a half millimeters posterior to the anterior wall of the sinus. And so that gives us kind of the perfect amount so that we can reach the anterior wall with our instruments without having to struggle and reach and potentially tear the membrane. And we wanna be above the sinus floor so we don't accidentally trowel into the alveolus and remove bone we don't want to remove or potentially weaken that bone. So if we place an implant, we get a fracture in the buccal plate. So this is where the guide wants us to go. And then here was our result. So you can see, unfortunately, we didn't get all the way to the anterior wall with the condensation of the graft, but we can see the window placement was correct about three and a half millimeters from the anterior wall and about 1.8 from the floor of the sinus. So bringing that into the mouth, the adjunct, um, just takes one more thing off the plate of the critical thinking portion um, of these surgeries. So it's always just nice to um, have, have something that you can bring in the mouth like that. So uh, something that's not done very much anymore um, is the subperiosteal implants. So in the maxilla, we have so many options nowadays for patients who are extremely atrophic. And, you know, we have the all in fours where we angle and to avoid the sciences altogether. Um, we have people placing zygomatic implants or pterygoid implants. So they're using bones that are outside of the bounds of the maxilla entirely. Um, you know, everyone has a cheekbone, but in the mandible, once you're so atrophic and you have so much resorption, there's, there's no other bone to go to. We're not doing hyoid implants. You know, the no bone in the mandible is also fixed. So a lot of these patients are essentially dental cripples and they're stuck with, um, 
you know, having to use a traditional denture. Um, maybe if they're lucky, you can get two implants in the in anterior and do an over denture, but uh, the posterior might be completely off limits. All that to say that subperiosteal implants um, used to be a bigger thing. And what it used to be was you'd have to do a full thickness flap, the entire mandible and take a polyether or polysulfide impression of the bone. So imagine doing a bony impression. So now you have impression material under a flap and hoping you don't lose any of that or doesn't fall off or get lodged under the lingual flap, under the floor of the mouth, you know, in the buccal mucosa. Um, I can't imagine that would have been a very fun day. Then you have to stitch the patient up. You send that model to the lab and they make you an implant that's, you know, cast to fit over your bone impression. And the patient comes back a month later and you reflap them. So you do the surgery all over again, except this time you're um, affixing the implant. Well, nowadays, if, if and when this is still appropriate, which I think it, with technology like this, I think it'll probably make more of a comeback because like I said, there's no other place to go in the mandible. We don't have zygomas in the mandible. Um, I, you can just take a CT and segment the jaw. And now you have that bone impression without having to do a pretty invasive surgery to get that data. So doing the bone segmentation with the lab, the lab can then digitally design your periosteal struts to like in this case, avoid the mental framing, um, you know, avoid undercuts and have it in the right restorative position as well. So in this um, case report, it was just done in 2020. So this is like, this is very recent. This isn't something that, um, you know, they're going back to the nineties and two thousands for, um, they were showing a custom made 3D printed subperiosteal implant. Um, so designed completely on the CBCT. And then here's their clinical photos from that case report. Um, so the flap, you know, a little bit less invasive than it would have been if we had to do the full bony model. So they've full thickness flap to fit the strut. Um, then they place the implants. Basically, they're putting fixation screws on the lateral portion of the implants. And then that the struts, the, um, the copings that are sitting up are used for, you know, cementing uh, crowns or a bridge in this case. Um, so we already talked about this, but bone borne guides, taking it into your own hands. I mean, the things you can do with segmented jaw bones, I think segmenting a jaw bone from a CT is probably one of the, the coolest things you can do, especially if you're doing, like I said, these bigger surgeries, having to ha hold this in your hand um, um, is certainly very helpful. So this is just the, the steps of that surgery. And then you have some pretty uh, clever uses. I, lo I love the music on this one. This is um, Baron Grutter. Um, has this on his website. Let me go back. Um, he calls it the mirror mitt, which, uh, well, let me play it now. But essentially, that little 3D printed disc you can see to the left of the mirror clips into the mirror and it will catch if you're in the back of the mouth, putting in tiny implant parts, titanium copings, multi unit screws, um, things like that. Um, it's there to kind of be your catcher mitt. And so that's, this is the kind of stuff that. Um, that Baron is known for. He's just kind of a tinkerer um, and the stuff that you can get that at his website if you wanted it. Um, but you know, that costs a 50 cents to print out and you could autoclave it once if it's made in surgical guide resin and just for maybe those days where you're gonna be doing an all on six and there's one way in the back, number three, you put that in your mirror just as an extra stop gap um, as well as a throw pack or something like that. So whatever you dream up can be design, designed and printed you know, dentistry, 3D printing in dentistry is pretty new, but 3D printing in industry has been around for a long time. Um, so anything you can dream up, you can design in a CAD program and 3D print. Um, this is something that we did in our office too. You, obviously anything you can just, you can think up. So people on this, um, this website called Thingiverse, there's tons of free downloadable STLs. We've printed um, saber tooth tiger molds uh, since we, got here in Arizona, these cars, these little dinosaurs for toys for children or something like that. Um, and for social media. So my practice, I made a little when Yoda, when the Mandalorian was first came out and it was super, super big. Everyone thought this was baby Yoda. Um, we put, we printed a little baby Yoda and gave him a new patient exam. And so we got a lot of funny content and people just think it's cool. And, and then we got a lot of patients asking us for baby Yoda uh, to take home. So um, yeah, I think that 3D printing um, is, a definite return on your investment. I think there's no question. If you go back to the first four things we talked about right there, it makes sense, especially if you're doing a liner ortho, but the iterations and the evolution of 3D printing are 
just only growing and it's only limited by how creative people can be. Um, so I think that we're going to have more and more advancement, especially in the surgical realm when it comes to those bone segmentation models um, and things that we can bring into the patient's mouth to adjunct, um, you know, our our surgeries or even things like endodontics. They're going to make endodontic guides that snap over the tooth and, and actually will tell your drill where to go to find that, that pesky missing canal. So things like that are going to be super uh, useful and necessary and take our profession to the next level. So if you're not currently doing a 3D printer um, in your office, I think it makes the most sense. Um, like I said, for less than $10,000, less than one of those, you know, Schick sensors, you can get um, like the whole suite of uh, uh, different things for 3D printing and bring all of this into your own practice. So I'll open it up to questions and um, hopefully um, if you guys have any questions, just shoot them in that Q&A box. Um, there's a question here from Michael it says, uh, implants, do they require replacement over time as in a matter of years or could they be permanent? Uh, I'm not sure which implants you're talking about, but um, yes, implants are permanent if you take care of them, um, just like anything. Implants, the only way you can lose an implant is basically through periodontal disease or trauma or infection. So um, I think that implants in general, I, I never tell patients they last forever. Um, don't tell patients implants last forever. That's just setting yourself up for um, some difficult conversations um, if things don't go well. Um, but implants are probably the most long-term right now option for tooth replacement, yeah. Um, so one of the uh, basic challenges in counter the implants executed, do they get easily fitted? Um, dental implant, if you're doing surgical guides, it's probably the most uh, efficient and accurate way to place implants in the right spot. The part with implants and is you have to understand how to do everything without a guide first, like why you're doing things. Like where are you gonna put the implant where it would be best suited to put a crown on it or a bridge on it or a denture on it or a fixed hybrid. Um, if you don't understand that, you can't just jump right to uh, guides and think you're gonna be fine. So you really have to have a good understanding of, <clears throat> excuse me, how, how and why implants work um, and, and where to place them and how to place them. And then the you know, surgical guides are just an adjunct to that. They're not, I always tell students that a surgical guide is, it's a, um, it's a help, it's not a crutch. You know, it's not going to get you over the finish line. It's just going to help you tell you where the finish line is, in a sense. Um, Max says, I know that you mentioned that you can get a wax up done to make your own putty metrics for temps. Can you make temporaries for aesthetic cases and reline chair sites? Certainly, yeah. There's a lot of new materials out there now. Uh, Bago is a really popular one. Um, it's a crown and bridge. They also have MFH, which stands for microfilled something, something. Um, so there are some aesthetic and you can buy them in different shades. Um, so you would just give yourself like a spacer in your model, essentially. You'd want some sort of hard tissue stop. If you remember that slide from Dr. Sonata had the, it indexed on the palette. So, you know, one problem if you do all the preps is and you put the reline temps in, you, you can overseat them or underseat them. So if you, let's say you're doing six to 11, you could just have the, the temp shell also fit over three and three to five and and 12 to 14, right? So like it snaps in like a surgical guide and you reline the temps that are six to 11. You can certainly do that. Um, Kat just said, do you have a recommendation for CE regarding surgical guides? Should it be tied into the implant brand that's utilized? I don't think it needs to be tied to the implant brand. I think most, uh, I don't know that many implant companies themselves do CE on surgical guides. There's so many softwares out there. I'd say more likely it'd be tied in with the, the brand of comb beam you have because a lot of the comb beam softwares actually have planning software built in. So we use the Actaeon Prime here and they have a, the slides you would have seen uh, of our search guides, they have a built-in planning and guided software. So knowing the software is one thing, but utilizing it, you know, it'd be nice to know if you're placing Bio Horizons and you had their guided kit, you might want uh, a refresher or some CE on how to use that kit in particular. Um, but actually making the surgical guide, there's so many courses out there. If, you, if you're a real tinkerer like I was, you could do Blue Sky Bio. Um, tons of courses from guys like Baron Grutter, Corey Glenn, um, Danny Domain. Um, awesome, awesome knowledge bases. And um, you can even learn it all on YouTube University. Um, but yeah, there's software. I would look more into what software you, you want to be comfortable using. So if you are already locked into a certain cone beam, maybe they have a software that you could utilize. Um, that learn how to make the guides yourself. Or like I said, you could have a, you could always have a lab make it for you. Tell them, hey, I place 
XYZ implant. I use this guided kit. Um, here's the cone beam. Here's the STL, the patient's model. And they can just send you the guide with the report. And then, so you can just print it, right? So you don't have to necessarily be the one that designs the guide. You might, they might have a Zoom call with you or a webinar or whatever and say like, hey, here's what I'm thinking and go through the plan with you. But they could just as easily drop box or email you the file and you print it yourself in the office to save a little bit of money. Yeah. Any other questions? Got about five minutes left here if anyone has questions. If not, we'll wrap a little early today. Um, while we're waiting to see if any others come in, I do want to mention that today's webinar was recorded. So everyone on here today will get a recording of this webinar about one week from today. So keep a lookout for that. Awesome. And then here's my contact info. If you guys have any questions, um, my email Vorhold at implantpathway.com. And then I'm most active on Instagram. If you are interested in implant surgery, um, I'm constantly sharing story, bloody, bloody stories. So if, you know, if you have a light stomach, maybe don't follow me on Instagram, but um, if you want to follow me on Instagram, Vorhold DDS, um, I post a lot of the stuff that we do here at Implant Pathway, whether it's courses or just follow-ups. Um, one of the things that I'm getting kind of well known for is uh, complications management, because as you can imagine, we place 5,000 implants a year through our courses, and I'm the guy who um, sees all the follow-ups, so I get to see a, such a such a high volume that I'm bound to see um, a pretty good selection of complications. So um, I post a lot of those on my Instagram and how we manage them and stuff like that. Um, what are some things you wish printers were better at? I think I wish printers were a little bit like, and they're getting better, but when they first started, they weren't super user friendly and there were a lot of failures. So if you were one of the uh, a dentists who wanted to dip your toes into 3D printing and you bought something like a Photon or a Frozen, like these printers that are less than a thousand dollars and they're like, they're meant for like toy printers, really, really small build plates. Um, they failed a lot and they don't, you don't necessarily know why they failed. So it'd be nice to have when you buy your printer, have someone come out, have take a webinar, take a couple hours and be like, hey, this is great on how to set up the prints. What happens when it goes bad? And how do I find out why it failed? And so when a print fails, essentially it means that the somewhere that, that didn't cure, right? So like it's going through the middle of your model, it stops curing and it, you end up with a broken model. And the worst part about that is you have a hardened resin in your resin tank that you have to clean before you print again, or else it'll get in the way. You have to have liquid only in there. So you have to dump the entire resin tank out, filter it with a paint filter, clean it out, get all the parts and pieces and put it back. So that's probably the most obnoxious thing about 3D printers is when they don't work right. I've always had good luck with Sprint Ray. Um, unless you, know, you, most of the failures I can blame on myself. Usually I didn't put enough supports or I removed enough supports that it didn't uh, print that well. And I think what's really cool is that even, even in the Sprint Ray iteration, it went from the Moon Ray S to the Pro 95 to the, now there's a Pro 55 and they're just getting more and more accurate. So, and the speed is going faster. So from the Pro 95 to the Moon Ray, the speed has doubled. Um, and the Pro 95 to the 55, the accuracy has doubled. So the dimensional accuracy. Now, is that necessary for most 3D printing applications? No, um, the Pro 95 will hit 95%. That's not why they call it Pro 95, but 95% of the stuff you wanna do um, can be printed on that. If you start getting into those intricate, you know, temporaries like you were talking about, um, reline temps, then you might want to look into the 55, which just has a much smaller XY dimension, 55 micron dimension. Um, and that can look a little bit more aesthetic. You'll get a little bit more detail. So, um, but I think it's only going to get better and better, um, you know, as things. And nowadays with like Sprint Ray and Formlabs, I think has them as well, but they have like these, these, uh, these wash and cure stations. It used to be you had to wash it yourself. They would just print and say, all right, you're on your own. And you'd have to make some sort of, uh, you know, handmade isopropyl alcohol washing station and curing station with like a nail salon cure bed. Now, after a couple of years, they've all come out with some sort of automated wash and cure solution. So it's a lot cleaner for you and your staff and you and your dental office. So you don't have a bunch of smelly resin um, sitting in Walmart, you know, Tupperware containers, which is what I did. All right. Cool. Anything else? No? I think we got everything. So thank you, Dr. Vorholt, for the great presentation. Thank you, everyone, for joining.
uh, feel free to reach out to Dr. Vorhold if you have any questions or email us at webinars at henryshine.com and we are more than happy to assist you. Like I said, recording will be sent out within a week, so look out for that. Uh, thanks for joining. Have a great weekend. All right. Thank you.